for being here. What a great night. Um, Paul Muldoon, one of our best ambassadors, lovely man. Um, part of my job as executive director of the Aspen Writers Foundation is to sell these authors and to keep praise on them and to make you understand why we feel it's so important to lure authors from all over the world to our tiny, beautiful, spectacular town. And to get you in the door so you can absorb the words of these larger-than-life individuals who bear their souls and invite you into their minds. Can you hear me? <laughs> Getting to know Paul over the years has made my job tonight pretty easy, and Google has made it even easier. <laughs> Type his name into the site and see what you get. Dazzling, exhilarating, force of nature, inventive, daring, hugely talented, wicked, stylish, and fun. I personally would like to add that to that kind, sweet, genuine, caring, patient, and somewhat intimidating. As I said before, Paul is a true ambassador for the Aspen Writers Foundation, and I cannot begin to thank him for his advice, his time, his willingness to share his words, his wit, his family with us again tonight. Speaking of ambassadors, I want to thank the sponsors of this event, Wendy Arusty and Fred Durham, Kathy O'Connell and Fred Fenrick, the City of Aspen, Lake Onda Aspen, the Aspen Times, Aspen Sojourner, and a very special new partner, Imagine Ireland, an initiative of Culture Ireland, and you'll be hearing more about that partnership very, very soon. And I also want to thank, thank the wonderful Aspen Public Radio. Stay tuned for more information on all of our partnerships, including one with Grassroots TV, and I hope that you'll tune into our, uh, our website for all of the updates that we've got going on, not only for Winter Wars, but for the great read series that we're offering currently. I'm going to step aside now and make room for another fabulous partner and friend, Kathy Clue. Aside from being a Muldoon enthusiast, Kathy is Aspen High School's college counselor, and she also advises me as well. We think the world of her, of Warren, of Chris, of Missy, their soon-to-be little blue grandchild. And we often quote Kathy whenever we need to be reminded of the importance of, of much of what we do. As she once said, the Aspen Writers Foundation provides vital experiential and academic programs in the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond. And the return on your investment in our kids is exponential. I have not yet introduced myself. I am Lisa Casiglio, the Executive Director of the Aspen Writers Foundation. It's my very, very huge honor to introduce Kathy. I did Google Paul, and the 21 pages later, I did get to a schedule, and he is opening his very busy year with us. So welcome to Aspen, and thank you for making um, our year off to a good start. I was in a small hamlet, much like our own, called Ripton, Vermont, many years ago. And after a day of bridge jumping and going to the Frost Farm, we came to the central event of the day, which was the graduation of Breadloaf um, School of English. And uh, it was to be followed by a dance in the barn. But in between those two events, the speaker was going to take the stage. And amid all that denim, there he came in his red and white robes. I had robe envy at that point. I thought perhaps my doctorate at DU in dark blue would look very pedestrian compared to his regal red and white. Curls, robes, and above all, the voice was introduced. And he spoke all at once to his students of the summer and to the entire world. I was in that audience. And that moment, I met a living poet. And he generated so much interest in, in that group, that diverse group of individuals spread out on the lawn that evening. I was so impressed that I went home and started to find out who this voice was. Foremost was the prize. Um, after his T.S. Eliot, his Pulitzer, and every other prize I read on the pages of your biography is the prize of his reader's um, hearts and his reader's interest. And I could see he uh, engaged it that night. Several years later, I had the opportunity to be in an elevator with him. And I recognized him, and I thought, it's Paul Dune. And I'm Irish enough to know 
that uh, he has taken the gift of a man with a keen eye and a great heart and combined it with his pen and his mouth to become the greatest living poet of our time. I was a little bit silenced for just a second, and I said, are you Paul Muldoon? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I'm a great fan, and I still am. Oh, and uh, thank you for speaking to me in the elevator. I felt very blessed. <laughs> He's a man you don't forget. And uh, yeah, as I said, the curls, the robes, the voice, it's all there. But his eye and his heart, as I said, that are synced with his mouth and his pen are his magic. I am very proud to present uh, someone the writers call both difficult and boyish at the same time. I thought the oxymoron was was charming. I am pleased to introduce Paul Muldoon of Belfast and Princeton, a man and a poet you too will long remember. That is so gentlemen, it's inevitable that you will be disappointed after that introduction. <clears throat> what a great delight to be back in Aspen um, and to be here for several days. Um, my wife and my two children adore this town and so many wonderful people who have been so kind to us over the years in it. So it's an honor to be back here. <clears throat> I'm going to read for about 40, 45 minutes or so. How are we doing in the sign front? A little bit up? Okay? No? Fine. Okay, I'm going to read, read for about 45 minutes or so. Where to begin? I, I think I'll begin back in Ireland. I was brought up in County Armagh, which is about halfway across Northern Ireland. And my mother was a school teacher in the local primary school, or grade school, as we call it there, which meant, of course, that <clears throat> when she went out to school in the morning, I was required by law to, to go with her. Uh, so this is a poem about uh, the school I attended as a, a primary school child, and about one of the characters who, unlike myself, very rarely showed up there. He was a mitter, to use a word we use in that part of the world, or at least we used in that part of the world. Mitcher, a word used by Shakespeare, and it means someone who plays truant, someone who does not attend school. Um, this particular character is called, or at least the main component of his name, is Joseph Mary Plunkett. And Joseph Mary Plunkett, as many of you will recall, was a poet and a patriot who took part in the 1916 Rising in Dublin and was shot um, for his part in the insurrection. So. Um, much comes with the name of this young student. One can read into his name something of his history, something of the political position of his family, which would have been um, active republicanism, uh, fighting for the cause of Ireland. <clears throat> so the poem is called Anshaw. When the master was calling the roll at the primary school in college lands, you were meant to call back Anshaw and raise your hand as your name occurred. Anshaw meaning here, here and now, all present and correct was the first word of Irish I spoke. The last name on the ledger belonged to Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward and was followed, as often as not, by silence 
knowing looks, a nod and a wink, the master's droll, and where's our little ward of court? I remember the first time he came back. The master had sent him out along the hedges to weigh up for himself and cut a stick with which he would be beaten. After a while, nothing was spoken. He would arrive, as a matter of course, with an ash plant, a sally rod, or finally, the hazel wand he had whittled down to a whip lash. Its twist of red and yellow lacquers, sanded and polished, and altogether so delicately wrought that he had engraved his initials on it. I last met Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward in a pub just over the Irish border. He was living in the open in a secret camp on the other side of the mountain. He was fighting for Ireland, making things happen. And he told me, Joe Ward, of how he had risen through the ranks to quartermaster, commandant, how every morning at parade his volunteers would call back Anshaw and raise their hands as their names occurred. So this next one has to do with uh, an outing we took almost every Sunday, uh, it seemed, when I, in life when I was a kid. And generally, there was not a great deal of um, variety to these little trips we took. We usually went to visit a graveyard somewhere, somewhere within a, a, a manageable radius. 5, 10, 15, or maybe 20 miles. Uh, graveyard visitations in that part of the world uh, were very popular. It was a way of putting in one's time. We did not have poetry readings, for example. Um, so we really had to find something to do, and this is what we did. Um, now, for a long time, we depended on one particular uncle, Uncle Pat, for a ride or a lift for our graveyard visitations. Then we got a car of our own. The first trip we took in this car was to visit a roundabout, uh, a traffic circle, i.e. at a place called Ballygawley, and it was the first roundabout in Ireland. And needless to say, we had to, funny enough, I was talking to uh, someone earlier today about, about uh, other ways in which we amused ourselves. For example, we went sometime in the 19, early 1960s to Dublin Airport. We, did, we were not taking a flight. We were not going anywhere. We just went there to see how the airport was looking and how, how it functioned. So we were quite easily amused, I think, in many ways. <coughs> So we'd heard a lot, of course, about the construction of the uh, roundabout. Local people were working on it and uh, were coming back with tales of the marvels, the concept, of course. Uh, and we were, we were just about able to take it in, but, uh, of course, only when we experienced it at first hand were we really able to appreciate the sophistication of the roundabout as a concept. Um, so anyway, this poem has to do with that. I mentioned along the way the B specials, the second division of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the local police force, who were disbanded in the 1970s for um, mis misbehaving. 
Um, I mentioned the sash my father wore, the great orange song. Um, I mentioned the Pope, who perhaps needs no introduction. Uh, though that might change. Anyway, here we go. The sightseers, my father and mother, my brother and sister, and I, with Uncle Pat, our dear best loved uncle, had set out that Sunday afternoon in July in his broken down Ford not to visit some graveyard. One died of shingles, one of fever, another's knees turned to jelly. But the brand new roundabout at Ballygally, the first in mid-Ulster. Uncle Pat was telling us how the B specials had stopped him one night somewhere near Ballygally and smashed his bicycle and made him sing the sash and curse the Pope of Rome. They held a pistol so hard against his forehead there was still the mark of an O when he got home. Now this next one um, takes uh, off from, um, it began as a poem <coughs> about one of my favorite birds, the great turkey buzzard. And I haven't seen any out here this time, but you ha do you get them out here? You do? The turkey buzzard I discovered as I began to look into the phenomenon um, is a bird that began, it seems, mostly on, in, in the southeastern part of this country. <coughs> but because of the great interstate system developed by Eisenhower, after the war, hate to lose a poetry lover. <laughs> I know. It's our, my own children are not, would not come to this. <laughs> Needless to say, they've been to, they've been to one poetry reading too many. But anyway, <laughs> let, let, well, yeah, who knows? Um, the, um, what was I going to say? The turkey buzzard, the turkey buzzard, by virtue of the great interstate system, it seems, um, spread right through the country, <laughs> taking advantage of the many free lunches <laughs> along the way. So this was a poem that began with a musing upon an ode to the turkey buzzard. But it, it, insofar as there was a plan, and I had the privilege earlier today of going out to one of the local schools, the Rocky Mountain uh, School out there, and I was talking about uh, the extent to which ideally one does not know how a poem is going to end up, what it's about, really what's going to happen, um, on the principle that if I know what it's doing, what's going to happen, then you probably know what's going to happen too. So part of the adventure for all of us is that we end up somewhere we didn't expect to be. So I certainly didn't expect to be where I ended up here because writing this poem, uh, what I thought the poem might have been about, the subject matter was shouldered out to some extent by the subject matter of my sister, who coincidentally was uh, dying um, slowly 
from ovarian cancer. So her predicament really takes over the poem. It's a fairly grim, grim poem, but you know what? We'll have that and then we'll, we'll have a change of mood perhaps. Turkey buzzards. They've been so long above it all. Those two petals, so steeped in style, they seem to stall in the kettle, simmering over the town dump. Or better still, the neon flashed, X-rated rump of fresh roadkill, courtesy of the interstate that Eisenhower would overtake in the home straight by one horsepower. The kettle where it all boils down to the thick scent of death. A scent of such renown, it's given vent to the idea buzzards can spot a deer carcass a mile away. Smelling the rot as once, Marcus Aurelius wrinkled his nose at a gas leak from the great sewer that ran through Rome to the Tiber. Then... <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I must be uh, close to another microphone. Speak over there. Ah, forgive me. Sorry about that. The great sewer that ran th th through Rome, through Rome, to the Tiber, then went searching out through the gloam. One subscriber to the other view that the rose, full-blown, antique, its no-frills rough, the six-foot shrug of its swing wings, the theologians and the thugs twin triumphings in a buzzard's shaved head and snood. Buzz, buzz, buzzy. Its logic, in all likelihood, somewhat fuzzy, would ever come into focus, it ever deign to dispense its hocus-pocus in that same vein as runs along an inner thigh, to where, too right, the buzzard vouchsafes not to shy away from shite, its mission not to give a miss to a bete noir, all roly-poly, full of piss and vinegar, trying, rather, to get to grips with the grommet of the gut, setting its tin snips to that grommet in the spray-painted hind's hind gut and making a sweeping, to right, a sweeping cut that's so blasé. It's hard to imagine, dear sis, why others shrink from this sight of a soul in bliss. So in the pink from another month in the red of the shambles, like a rose in over its head among brambles. Unflappable in its belief, its ararat on which the ark would come to grief, abjuring that Marcus Aurelius humbug about what springs from earth succumbing to the tug at its heartstrings, reported to live past 50, as you yet may, dear sis, perhaps growing your hair in requital, though briefly, of whatever tears at your vitals, knowing perhaps from the nifty, nay, thrifty way these buzzards are given to stoop and take their ease by letting their time-chastened poop fall to their knees till they're almost as bright with lime as their night roost. Their poop containing an enzyme that's known to boost their immune systems should they prong themselves on small bones in a cerebral cortex at no small cost to their well-being. 
sinking fast in a dear crypt. Buzzards getting the hang at last of being stripped of their command of the vortex. While having lost their common touch, they've been so long above it all. <clears throat> Let me read a uh, little song lyric, if I may, just to uh, get ourselves out of that particular mode. <clears throat> this is a song, I don't know if I should say song, song, poem, poem, song, whatever it is, that mentions along the way uh, fresh kills. And fresh kills, many of you will recognize as the name of uh, the landfill site out towards JFK, I believe it is. Forgive me. St forgive me. Staten Island. Staten Island. Fresh Kills, Staten Island, landfill. <clears throat> Julius Caesar was a people person. <laughs> Julius Caesar was a people person. He knew how people felt. He knew it took a little coercion when the people were the Celts. In a mountain pass, he'd kick some ass, then hightail it back to the gym, till the top brass got fed up on mass and had their knives out for him. He shrank from Brutus's mild aspersion with an et tu, Brute? Et tu? Julius Caesar was a people person, a people person like you. This is a, a song of love gone wrong, as, as you may have detected. <laughs> Machiavelli was a people person <laughs> whose ambition was quite huge, yet he steered clear of the bold assertion and went by subterfuge. He tried to convince any would-be prince he must work behind the scenes. Though it made him wince, it didn't matter since the ends justify the means. He was always up for a little subversion, as in plotting a palace coup. Machiavelli was a people person, a people person like you. As I drove back from JFK the day you left me for Bill, I recalled your expressing the vagary that you adored fresh kills. Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein, they both loved a landfill. Saddam Hussein and Idi Amin, they both had your people skills. Joseph Stalin was a people person. He liked to put his stamp on people he sent for an excursion to some far-flung labor camp. Though we wondered why collectives wouldn't fly, he had no truck with self-doubt. Five years can go by in the blink of an eye when there's no time to laze about. That's why he favored physical exertion for the social parasite and Jew. Joseph Stalin was a people person. A people person like you. <laughs> Bit extreme, I know that. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes feelings run a little high. <laughs> um, let me, I was hearing today about the sighting of a coyote or a coyote. Either or either in these parts. And I thought I'd read a little poem about a coyote or coyote I came across a few years ago, actually in the vicinity of the Homer Noble Farm there in Vermont. And I was sitting uh, one evening with our wonderful new dog, um, Angus, alas, has now passed on. And we'd 
Uh, Angus was a dog that we found on petfinder.com. <laughs> and we picked him up in uh, somewhere in New York State, brought him home. I was sitting there for pretty much the first night, thinking, wow, this is the way to be. Out on the porch, the dog at the feet. And suddenly, I don't know why I say suddenly, gradually, um, a, a lot, not, not as far away as the back of this room, a coyote slash coyote came wandering along. It was a troubling moment. It was quite troubling in that this great new dog did not seem to notice the coyote. Um, um, thank you. And he just lay there in a heap. And what was even more troubling in its way was that the coyote did not seem to notice us. Um, I think really it was more troubling because one expects more, I think, of a coyote. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I refer along the way to the game of marbles, which was a game that we played as kids in Ireland, and I think perhaps it's still played in the, this country. Certainly they sell marbles in, uh, in uh, kids' stores. I don't know if kids use them much. They just sell them. Here we go. <laughs> Is there one over here? Sorry about this, folks. Please forgive me. I'm terribly sorry about this hard round. The coyote, veering down the track like a girl veering down a cobbled street in the meatpacking district, high heels from the night before, black shawl of black-tipped hairs, steering clear of that fluorescent ring spray painted on an even stretch of blacktop, like a ring in which we might once have played keepsies, bearing down the track without the slightest acknowledgement from Angus, the dog lying in a heap on our porch, like a heap of clothes lying beside a bed. Angus, who had himself been found wandering by the highway somewhere on the far side of Lake Champlain. Slubber-furred, slammer-kin, backbone showing through. And though we didn't know it when we brought him home, blind in one eye. The right one. The one between him and the coyote. The cloudy, flaw-fleckered marble of that eye, now turning on you and me, taking in the spray-painted ring where you and I knuckle down. Another little song, perhaps? You know, let me read this um, as a little, if I may, as a little tester uh, for what promises to be um, a fun evening on Sunday evening here at the Wheeler Opera House. One should get one's facts straight, I think, before one starts in the advertising business. However, the Wheeler Opera House, and on that evening, as many of you will know, we're having uh, Wes, John Wesley Harding is running his, his great, uh, um, what would one say? I suppose it's a variety show, his Cabinet of Wonders. And what I'd like to do by we jo John Wesley Harding, a Wes Stace, an absolutely brilliant songwriter, as many of you will know, and I had the pleasure recently of working with him on a song lyric. And just by way of a little taster for that occasion, um, if, if you haven't already signed to go to, up to go to it, 
well, let's hope this won't put you off completely. It's a, it's a song written by John Wesley Harding or Wes Stace and myself, and it's called Cover. Cover. It's a love song, needless to say. <laughs> I've covered Prince and Michael Jackson, the Simons, Paul and Carly, Fleetwood Mac and Saxon, Bob Dylan and Bob Marley. I've done the Pogues and Pixies, Van Halen and Van Dross, ABC, ACDC, the Dixie Chicks, Sticks and the Boss, Joe Brown and the Brothers, Mott the Hoople, Motley Crue. The only one I haven't covered is you. <laughs> I've covered Reg and Elvis Presley, the Wilsons, Jackie, and Pickett. Calvin Newborn, John Wesley Harding. That's meta. John Wesley Harding and the Crickets. I've done Meatloaf and Mountain, the Birds, Bananarama, Wayne Fontana, Fountains of Wayne, the Mamas and the Papas, the Mothers of Invention and the Moody Blues. The only one I haven't covered is you. One day I'll get my chance to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that Freddie Mercury was Persian. <laughs> and when you hear my new take on romance, you'll know it's the definitive version. I've covered P.F. Sloan and Leonard Cohen, the Joplin, Scott and Janice, Chuck D. and Buck Owens, the Church and Praying Mantis, I've done Rod Stewart on the Faces, Talking Heads, and Levon Helm, the OJs and Oasis, Warrens, Hens, and Zevon, Jojo and the Modern Lovers, Bill Haley, Husker Du. The only one I haven't covered is you. One day, do you think he's making his point overly uh, <laughs> vehemently? One day, I'll, one day I'll get my chance to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt the joys of joint creation. And when you hear my new take on romance, you'll know that it's a bold interpretation. I've covered Queen and B.B. King, C.C. Winans, D.D. Snyder, Wasp, The Scorpions, and Sting, Mitch Miller and Mitch Ryder. I've done Simply Red and Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, White Snake, and Yellow, Chuck Berry, Nina Cherry, and even Tom Morello. Deep Purple's Roger Lover, The Four Tops, US3, U2. The only one I haven't covered is you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll end with a little sequence of poems. I know the term sequence of poems is enough to make the heart <laughs> sink. For the full, for the fully grown audience <laughs> member, never mind the junior member. But anyway, <laughs> here we go. It's not too long, is all I can say to you. Um, the Wayside Shrines. It's a poem. Have a, it's a series of musings on the points along a road that began with a particular trip through New York State uh, and being aware, made aware again and again of the little monuments. Uh, the crosses, of course, and the various other manifestations uh, of grief and loss where um, fatal road accidents had occurred. So I'll read this, and then perhaps we'll have a chance for a question or two, if you have any, uh, or observations, or concerns. Uh, <coughs> and so let me read this. Wayside Shrines. Doomed as I was to follow a big rig laden with pigs and a wrecker with its intermittent strobe. I was all the more conscious of piles of rock marking the scene of a crash. 
some with handwritten notes, others a cache of snapshots in a fogged up glow. Even a makeshift mobile may see off one of Calder's and the path among the alders pan out like a prom queen's occipital lobe. Yet nothing can confirm one's sense of being prized like another's being anatomized. Having myself been run out of town, I might easily have gone down on my knees by each white cross or posy in its tin and resign myself to the fact a cord of dead wood may be stacked between two living trees. Even an acorn tastes bitter to the runt of the litter when it begins to feel the squeeze. Yet those pigs had seemed content in their profound disgruntlement. I might easily have followed the ruck to where a utility truck hit a dry stone bank, that red rag a token of where its load shifted and kicked off the beehive hut episode on which the narrative sank. Even the lily plugging an oil filter with its stem slightly out of kilter has somehow succeeded in pulling rank yet failed to lend much weight to whatever it means to commemorate. A flower pumped Pirelli tire that comes across as part tire, part tune, must have taken up a dare from a wiper blade that it could wholly fade while hastening to bloom. Even the spit splutter of baby's breath against a sand-ribbed shutter may look for all the world like spew, yet give no sign of the shoal where a prom queen would pit herself against the indefinite. Another plot lines come to rest in a tool chest emblazoned with throw tough, on which their roost a molten fuse, an ace of spades, and a pair of twos, where somebody's called somebody's bluff. Even a candle holder on top of the offending boulder speaks to a flame being snuffed, yet managing to live while it's completely inoperable. Had I had more than a glimpse of a lake through a break in a plateau, had I not suddenly been forced to break for Apollo wrapped in polythene, I might have been emboldened and gone with the flow. Even a road resists being led to water like a lamb to the slaughter at Isaac's truck and tow. Yet smoke had risen with next to no fuss, calm above the calamitous. Now, as gas prices soared, another billboard had held out injured before it all but implored, 1888, we can help. I caught the yelp from a clothesline of a plaid work shirt. Even a bald-faced bullock may falter, bless you, as it mounts an altar that's little more than a pile of dirt. Yet a storm window took a stance against what it must discountenance. Whatever had once put us out of skew now threw me for another loop as I took in a sky in which a couple of clouds had failed to catch, they'd never be a match for that high-flying trapeze troop. Even those former self-inflators who now fast on acorn meal and slaters were distorted by the sky hoop, yet ironed themselves out 
through the prism of early Irish monasticism. These modern monks whose low self-worth has them leave earth for a few years know that not only a wreath from a sacred grove but a styrofoam alcove marks the spot where they went clear. Even the ashes we scatter and the plaques we set up tend to flatter mostly their own engineers. Yet the smashing of a radiator grill may soothe the implacable. I might easily have knelt for this heartfelt lighting of a torch where someone nailed it or himself was nailed though the spot where we take a wrong turn is rarely marked by either an urn or a tire scorch. Even a dog and pup, mother and daughter, may half tote, half totter their matching luggage from a porch, yet be ingrained with a sense they too readily press the point of their devotedness. Dedicated as I was to getting the jump in the big rig, the fact that a stump might still bleed through a plaid shirt didn't chime with just how little any of this counts. When not even the grain in the grain silo amounts to chicken feed. Even her momentary taking shelter and finding some ease from the helter-skelter offered the prom queen a glimpse of what it is to succeed. Yet the sudden failure of a brake drum extended her lease on Elysium. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Any queries, questions, complaints? <laughs> Concerns? Oh, yes? Yes. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I answer that question. I, I usually don't know where the problem is going. Yeah, I generally don't know. Yeah, I know that sounds a bit strange. <clears throat> but, you know, Sometimes the image or the phrase that turns up at the end of the poem might be the one with which the poem got off the ground. And, and the, the writing of the poem is the exploration, the movement towards that. But in general, um, <coughs> I try, I mean, uh, who knows? I mean, one doesn't always succeed in this, of course, but when I try certainly not to know what I'm doing. Uh, and that actually comes quite easily to me. <laughs> um, but the thing about it is, it's also a bit nervous making. And I think one of the things, of course, writers work in all sorts of different ways. Uh, you know, um, the great W.B. Yeats um, was a poet who seemed to manage quite well um, with with actually quite a strong sense, in many cases, of where his poems were going. And as you probably know, <coughs> was in the habit of uh, working up prose arguments for his poems. He would say, I am going to write a poem set in Byzantium, and I'm going to include this image of a little mechanical bird, and it's going to mean this, and it's going to do that. And this is quite common, actually. Quite a number of his poems were um, almost had a um, had a, um, a a statement of purpose to himself. Um, you could imagine him going to a film producer with the idea for the uh, the pitch for the poem. Uh, but the point is that even though he knew quite a lot about where the poem might, what it might touch upon. Um, 
As those of you who might have read his drafts, there's a wonderful book edited by John Stallworthy called Between the Lines, which, re which gives us uh, the drafts of a number of Yeats's poems. And they're terrifically um, inspirational in that most of the time Yeats is just chugging along. He actually, you know, he makes one feel good in the sense that, you know, even Yeats was chugging along. And then something happened, and it's very hard to put one's finger on what it is, and something along the lines of what we used to think of as inspiration takes over. So that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about being open and humble before the possibility of what the poem might do, where it might bring one. That's the great adventure for me, and I think many others, of writing poems. And that's why one doesn't want to know what one's doing. Hmm? Yes? Did you have uh, Probably. I think most children do, or many children do. Uh, I, I think perhaps the larger proportion of children who, you know, learn to write at all, um, write poems, or if they don't learn to write, they may sing little songs in most cultures. And in fact, uh, so some of the poets that one might admire most are eight or nine-year-olds who come up with the most extraordinary images um, and poems for precisely the reason that we're discussing, uh, we were discussing just a moment ago, i.e. they don't know what they're doing. They have no preconceptions about what a poem is, what it might be doing, what anything looks like, what anything equals. And, you know, before they know it, they're in... Uh, an extraordinary world which allows us, if we partake of it and engage with it, look over their shoulders to see something about the world uh, as, as we think it is. So I probably did. I don't remember. I don't think. I started writing in earnest when I was probably about six, 15 or 16, something like that. Um, you know, which I think is quite common also. And uh, most people, of course, grow out of it. Yes. And uh, um, Yeats uh, has a great line about that. He says a man or a woman, perhaps, uh, he should be saying, dabbles in verses and they become his life. So much of it is about habit, really, that uh, the habit of being open to uh, the possibility of a poem happening through one. But uh, and in a strange way, I think when one's a teenager, of course, uh, one is even more persuaded that um, it's one's likely to be able to do it, right? Because one's persuadable of, any, uh, of anything as a teenager. So um, I think I was much more confident about the notion that I might be a poet than I w then than I am now. I think it's one of the things that happens, of course, is that one begins to realize that maybe, maybe it was rather a tall order to imagine that one could do it. So, anyway, yes, I'm not sure now. I don't want to <laughs> enter po. I don't want to get yes. Many of your lines uh, conjure a, a, a uh, an image of a picture. Mm -hmm. When you're writing your poetry, do you? Imagine some image that you put words to? Um, well, a lot of poems, I think, are very imagistic. I think, uh, I'm sh yes, a lot of, lot of poems, uh, well, operate on images. Mm -hmm. And indeed, as you know, there was a, a, m a movement in poetry known as imagism. Um, so seeing pictures, presenting pictures, visual images, I think is... It's quite common. Mm. So, yes. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about being called the editor of the New Yorker? What kinds of things do you see? Do you have surprises? How big a staff do you have? How many poems do you look at in a week? <laughs> um, well, <coughs> you know, there is... When I ask about how many poems come in, I usually hear that by the time... It would, we don't have time to count them. You know, so there are quite a few come in each week. I think generally, 
oh, let's say, I think 600 submissions, something like that. And in each of them, they may, there may be six or seven poems. You know, a lot of them come in electronically, um, of course, so it's in a strange way, it's easier to count them. But still, a number of them come in on, on, on the page. So we have a, a small staff, which is why we're always a little bit behind, in case any of you are wondering. Um, and uh, myself and, and one main assistant, then a couple of, uh, we always have a couple of uh, readers, interns who, who are working, who are working on, on uh, the submissions. So quite a small group of people reading them. Who are sending stuff? Oh, yeah, mostly. Well, <coughs> you know, one of the wonderful things about the New Yorker, it seems to me, is that there's a sense uh, that for so many people around the country that if they've written a poem, they should send it there. <laughs> and that, that I, I know that sounds a bit, uh, I don't mean to say, no, that, I, that is wonderful. I mean, we love that. We love that. And um, it does mean that we have a lot to read, but on the other hand, it means that you know people think of it as a a, <coughs> a venue for uh, for poetry, as well as being a venue for so many other things. But at the end of the day, we publish only a hundred, about a hundred poems a year, so you know it's quite tough. So we two poems a week essentially. So. It's quite difficult. Yes? First of all, <laughs> yeah, it's an Emily Dickinson spent so much time in her room alone as it was that <laughs> I can't imagine her being in there to begin with. <laughs> she would probably be out on snow mats, <laughs> skiing. Um, you know, funnily enough, somebody asked me the other day, in fact, it might have been someone, uh, in a, uh, it may have been an interview for a paper in Aspen asked me about who I'd like to be able to write like, and I said, Emily Dickinson. Has that appeared yet? Yeah. It has. Oh, see, I didn't see it yet. But funnily enough, I mean, it, it varies from, it's not that I'm inconstant, but I, there are so many poets, you know, who are just extraordinarily, I mean, to, to imagine that one would come anywhere near their, their um, gift is just... Uh, it's just too much. I mean, Emily Dickinson is an extraordinary poet, as you know. Um, though in a strange way, I say, as you know, as we know, I actually believe that we probably even haven't read Emily Dickinson yet. We're only, we've only very gradually, in the last few years, um, established, and if it is indeed established, what the texts of her poems might be. I mean, they're... If they are established, they're just established. <coughs> and uh, so we have a bit of catching up to do, I think, on Emily Dickinson. James Joyce, uh, extraordinary um, preacher. I suppose in many ways, like her, um, a one-off. So I think one might, in a strange way, be able to learn more from Emily Dickinson than James Joyce. Uh, James Joyce, genius, but he's also a, a dead end, I think, for other writers. You know, it's very, very difficult, perhaps impossible, to follow James Joyce. You know, he went to the end of the line. And, I mean, even his greatest fans... I think it's fair to say, find Joyce troublesome. You know, those of us who would claim, even those of us who would be bold enough to 
claim to have read <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, um, which would mean, in my case, of sort of running one's eye over it in its entirety, would not necessarily mean that one had read it. You know, I don't know if it's re I don't know if it's readable, actually. I don't know if one would ever arrive at the point at which one could say, I, I have read it. It's done. Um, and I think, you know, he opened up uh, a particular vein of punsterism, which is, while it's very, it's very close to our hearts and it's, it's a point at which uh, children, to go back to our earlier point, come in to poetry through puns. Um, and it's through puns that many of our um, great institutions, I suppose we might call them, including the Christian church, which was founded on a pun, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Um, <laughs> despite that, despite that, the pun is, is, uh, is something I think one has to use quite, or perhaps because of that, is something one has to use quite sparingly. And Joyce, as you know, was his, his stock and trade, certainly towards the end, was the pun. But the earlier work is quite, quite remarkable. So what would one learn? I suppose from Joyce, and indeed from both of them, someone asked Joyce and met him in the street and said, how, how's, how did it go today? And he said, oh, it was a good day. I wrote a sentence. And uh, they said, really? We had you trouble finding all the words? So he said, I had all the words. It was just getting them in the right order which is a little variation on a line from Coleridge, as you probably know, but um, I think that what one, I suppose what each of them continues to teach is that it takes a lot of time, at least for me, and I think many others, to write a line that looks as if it took no time to write. And that one has to be willing to do that Um, to, I think, to, to write anything interesting. Yes? Yeah. Alas, no, I, am a, I, I don't remember my dreams. I remember a dream every, <coughs> once every five years, something like that, or once every ten years. That's very, very dreary. Um, but I think in a strange way, I know it's almost done, uh, yes. I, 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 I think this may be our last question. Is that correct? One more. I think, uh, so I think in a strange way, I, my dream life is lived in my waking life. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but I, the dream life happens while I'm awake. One's partaking of, of something akin to the dream life, which of course is a terrifically organized life, it seems to me. We, we often uh, associate dream logic with what is illogical. Whereas dream logic is much more logical than our lurching through the day. I mean, it doesn't make sense how we get through the day. Do we know what's going to happen between 9 and 11 o'clock for any of us? Do we know what's happened up until now today? Anyway, so, you know, I think actually in a strange way, plugging into the unconscious, subconscious is something that um, at some level, if it, insofar as that's related to the dream world, um, I think actually is, is something that one may plug into in one's waking life as a writer. I don't know if that makes any sense. 
There's probably a doctor who says, no, no, that makes no sense. And one final question, perhaps? Yes, sir. Do you mean the form of that poem or that, or that poem? That poem. I think ideally each poem takes its own, makes its own shape in the world. It's true that many of them fall into familiar-ish shapes. But it's true that those who are, like myself, who are in, you know, programmed to some extent to be interested in what we talk of, what we speak of as received shapes, using rhyme, for example, and poems that turn out often as sonnets, say, um, or some, some traditional form. Um, those are traditional forms because they're very true to how we are, I believe. They are very true to some very basic thing about us. Um, in the case of the sonnet, here we have A, however we have B. Here we have A, moreover, don't we really have A? And those are the two basic ideas. And that's a lot for us to deal with. That's one of the reasons why we come back to that duration, even if it's a poem in free verse of 20 lines. Uh, it's about duration as much as anything else. So ideally, the poem st establishes how it wants to be in the world as it, as it progresses, but at the end of line two, you're going to know if it's going to be in free verse or if it might be a couplet or, and so on and so forth. The great trick, I think, is to avoid, the great danger, I think, is to avoid ending a poem too early and taking what seems to be a sense of resolution, which is actually perfectly fine, a, a revelation that is perfectly fine but which, in fact, if one were patient with it, we might get to an even greater revelation. And it's having the courage, or something akin to it, the foolhardiness, perhaps, to wait for that further cranking up or notching up that uh, one hopes one has the courage to do that as one goes on. Anyway, I think we have to end it there, folks. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, um, and of course, and uh, his family, Jean, the novelist, the wonderful writer for being here. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, he will be appearing at the Wheeler Opera House this Sunday, January 30th at 8 o'clock. Tickets are available at ashtonsinkers.com. Check our website, too. It'll be a fabulous literary vaudeville type show. Song and dance. Song, dance, <laughs> comedy, Judy <laughs> Mirman, Wilson Whitehead. John Wesley Hardy, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. Wesley Stace, a.k.a. John Wesley Hardy, mm -hmm. um, Michael Arthur um, Band. It'll be fantastic. Evan so Dando. Evan Dando, Julian Hatfield. So um, if you don't know these artists, come check out this extraordinary. Thank you so much. I know that if you have dinner reservations, I'm going to escort Mr. Muldoon to a table so he can sign some books just out in the lobby. So please let me get him through this little aisle right here. Thank you again very much, and we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you.